City of Stevens Point Board of Parks Commissioners Meeting, recorded Wednesday, May 6, 2020. So we begin with our roll call. Freckman? Here. Gladowski is absent right now. Paul is absent right now. Kirsch is also absent. McDonald? Oh, I got you muted. I'm sorry. Yeah, here. Hold on. Here. I, 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 <laughs> McDonald? O'Connick? Here. Trubilski? Here. Short? Here. Slowinski? Here. Sorensen? Here. Zerazua? Here. We have a quorum. Okay, very good. Moving on to item number two, approval of the minutes of the 4th of March, uh, 2020. And I assume you've all poured over it carefully. I can move approval. A second. McDonald, okay, and a, uh, comic. Okay, any comments or corrections? Hearing none, okay, a motion to approve is, we've, we've already had the motion, motion to approve. So all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. All right, item number three, the first regular item on the agenda, uh, the lease agreement with Golden Sands Resource Conservation and Development Council for garden sites located at 300 Franklin Street and on the corner of West Cornell and West Whitney in Mead Park. And my understanding is that uh, the agreements are really the same except for change in date um, of the uh, 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 agreement that is um, about to, uh, to lapse. And that, uh, there should be copies of both of those in your handout. So is there any discussion? Uh, yes, Bob, I just wondered uh, what kind of participation they have or are they anticipating this year? We do have Amy with us, Bob, if you'd like to recognize her with Golden Sands. Okay, yeah, Amy. Uh, participation from the city you're asking is that what you're asking Liz I was I was wondering how many people are going to be renting spaces or, or I signed up for spaces oh yeah um, this year we have really good signups because we've been doing some improvements to kind of um, you know rebuild some of the beds that were rot the bed frames that were re rotting and redoing landscaping and stuff um, Franklin Street always gets good sign up we have nine beds there's a 10th bed that has raspberries planted in it and everybody enjoys that. Um, and Franklin is full again. Cornell Whitney, um, that was the one that needed a lot of refurbishment. And so we worked on that the last couple of years. Uh, we had some students from SPASH help with that. Um, and we have really good signups. Last I looked, we had just a couple beds left. There's 16 beds at Cornell Whitney. So it's a bigger site. Oh, great. I think it's really a nice program and thank you for doing it. Thank you. We do we do enjoy um, trying to make that available. Um, some you know garden plots available for people uh, who need the space to grow their own food. So um, we do feel like it's a valuable um, addition to the community. Are they being uh, some of those being uh, worked actively right now? Uh, yeah, it sounded like people were starting to plant. They were. Um, right. The Cornell Whitney site, the water barrels weren't filled yet and somebody asked about that. And so we're prompting the neighbor to get those filled right away because it is planting season. Yeah, as of May 1, people are allowed to start planting. Okay. Um, let's see. Any other comments? Okay, so we need a motion to approve and a second. Okay. And uh, no further discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? I'm just going to double check. Was it O'Connick with the motion and was it McDonald with the second just so I've got it? I think the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Got it. All right. Okay. And we've ordered, right? Yep, I've got a, I was a unanimous. Okay, yeah. Okay, item number four, um, the Emerson Park concept uh, plan design. And uh, we had uh, a preliminary discussion on this I think a couple of meetings ago. And there should be a um, map uh, showing the proposed uh, development. And do we have anybody that wants to make any comments uh, regarding this right now? So I see we do have, uh, we have Alderperson um, Nabel and Al Alderperson Johnson on the line that are with the Friends of Emerson Park who have been a tremendous partner of ours uh, to get us to the point where we are. Um, in your packet, I just summarized real quickly and I'm gonna share my screen here too for just a second. Uh, there was a number of changes that got incorporated from the last time. So uh, Alder Johnson, Alder Nabel, are you okay if I go first on this piece? Absolutely. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead quick and share a fly through here with everybody. You should see that now. So this updated fly through, and then I will load the concept here for you too, is just gonna depict a number of the changes that uh, all A was taken from the feedback here um, at this meeting in February, as well as from over 200 participants on an, uh, an actual survey that was conducted throughout the community. One thing you'll notice uh, right off the bat is that the playground has been expanded uh, slightly to incorporate a swing set that came up as a reoccurring theme throughout the feedback that we got from the community. The Friends of Emerson were really responsive to try and incorporate that piece to uh, not only take care of the toddler age group, but also the uh, five to 12 year olds and, and up so that there's belt swings and kind of a toddler swing component to it. Uh, while it shows a couple different, I'm gonna call them jungle gym playgrounds, these are not specific to what they would be. Really that's a whole nother planning purpose in the future. It's more of a placeholder that shows what this could look like. You'll also notice that uh, before there used to be the cornhole bag games that were over on the green space area. Um, it was put it out and how sensitive the green space is and that we wanted to maximize that. So those games were shifted over into this corner of the green space between the court and the entry sidewalk uh, off of Clark Street. Then on the east side or east road, east street side of the park, uh, we've got two accessible uh, parking stalls so that they, uh, a person that would maybe need those could have an accessible route to every structure within the park, which would make this park basically entirely ADA compliant, uh, which is a focal point from the group as well of being accessible to all. You'll also notice as we go through the fly through a little further, the bike racks that used to be a little bit uh, cumbersome and in the way of some of the entries have now been moved. So uh, one was replaced with a drinking fountain, which will come in here a little closer in just a second right as we zoom in this used to be a bike rack in this corner that's been replaced with a drinking fountain that has both heights an accessible height stand up height as well as a, a ground height potentially for a maybe an animal the animal uh, drinking station if we'd like to incorporate it you'll see some of the greenery and natural plantings they're not identified exactly what the plantings are at this point they're really placeholders but there's locations to do some of those key things here's a great visual to show you what the multi-use court could look like uh, what you'll notice in the middle is kind of the color compacted traditional tennis court uh, the multiple lines you see going across the middle would, would uh, show that the pickleball court would fit within it. And then you'll notice that the basketball court lines are on the outside edges. One potential again down the road once the, the concept is approved. This is not designed for full court games. You'll have a net across the middle. It's really designed to have again more of that neighborhood atmosphere where you can play on the court. Some communities actually lower one of the hoops so maybe uh, young kids can play on it. Those are all things the friends have been really doing a due diligent process of talking through, uh, and that'll be identified when they get into the process a little later. Um, as you swing through, obviously you can see there's still quite a bit of green space even around these amenities. See a full, row, full brand new kind of row of trees. Again, the trees are really placeholders. Some of them are, are already in the park, um, but the idea is, is that the forestry department would work within, with the friends uh, as well to try and, and put basically trees to line the boulevards on the edges here, wherever applicable potentially maybe even more trees that would go between the sidewalk and the uh, curb that not necessarily on the plan, but the idea is to show that there can be trees uh, along the playground for some shade structures and wherever else it'll fit within the park. Here kind of zooms you in that the shelter, as you look in, uh, has a shelter, a, a shaded area, as well as potential down the road having restrooms in the park uh, if, if funding and, and that process would come to be. You see kind of the round commons area. There's one of those, I, I jumped around here a little bit, I'm sorry. There was one of the bike racks on the outside right here by my cursor. 
another bike rack on the other side. Again, keeping that traffic roll uh, clean. There's another one on the east uh, avenue side of the park that has the uh, bike rack as well. Here's another close up that kind of shows the playground. So this is the most up to date uh, fly through that depicts the, the proposed changes that they took into account leaving uh, uh, from the last meeting as well as that feedback. And then also you'll see that the green space is now basically wide open uh, to be used for basically any sort of play that wants to be there. There's a backstop for kickball or potentially playing catch or a basket or a baseball game or softball, as well as the potential if we wanted to flood that ice rink to still fit in that area. And from that, I think that's a pretty good summary. Um, so I, I guess what I wanted to say is staff has been working alongside this. Uh, the Friends of Everson Park have been really receptive to a number of feedback items. And with that, I guess I can turn it over to uh, Alder Zarazua and Alder Nabel. Well, I, I assume you meant Johnson. I'm sorry, yep. <laughs> Alder Johnson, my fault. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's okay. Um, although Alder Zarazua could do a fabulous job as well. Um, I first, I just want to express my sincere appreciation to Dan and the Parks Department. Um, Dan's been an absolute delight to work with and such an incredible asset um, guiding the Friends of Emerson Park. Um, we could not have done this without him. So kudos to him. We have a fabulous team member and, and the city's very lucky to have him. My second shout out goes out to Rettler Corporation who has provided all of this work in kind um, to the Friends of Emerson Park. And uh, they've just been amazing to work with. They've listened to us. Um, they've incorporated so much of what we wanted. And we started out by working with a group of students from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point in their outdoor recreation plan. Much of what you see started as their work which then the Friends of Emerson Park kind of worked with and played with, started working with Dan, brought in Rettler. Um, Rettler has provided us several tens of thousands of dollars in in-kind support for the Friends of Emerson Park. So cannot thank them enough. And then all of the people who also um, submitted answers to the surveys. This has just been a great community process um, the Friends of Emerson Park, of course, is a grassroots organization, and, and we really, really brought in the community to come together with this design. Um, we're thrilled. Um, now the hard work starts. Um, a capital campaign, and of course, it's not a great, great time to do a capital campaign, but we're committed to, to doing that. We are now working with uh, Create Portage County as a part of that capital campaign and a number of other community leaders. Um, I have every confidence that we'll be able to pull together the funding for this. So I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have about the process, about the Friends of Emerson Park. And um, if you've, you know, got a couple hundred thousand dollars sitting in your back pocket, please make your check payable to the Community Foundation um, for the Friends of Emerson Park. Melissa? Yes. Um, one of the questions that came up at the last meeting was to keep the neighbors informed? Has that been yep. taken care of? Yes. Okay. The, the, the neighbors, um, actually it started out with the neighbors. We, the, When the Friends of Emerson Park, the whole idea kind of coalesced, our first meetings were people from the neighborhood. Okay. And, I just and, remember one of the people complaining that they weren't aware of what was going on at one of our meetings. Yeah, I think there was one person, but Cindy and I, Alder Nabel and I, this is our district. We, you know, we, we walk the district, we know our neighbors. Um, I had a conversation yesterday with one of the neighbors and she was excited to, to learn about the new plans. So um, always can do a better job at outreach. I think all of you know that, but um, it's not perfect, but yeah, we, we let people know when the meetings are, people are invited. We don't meet in secret. This is very open. Thank you. Good question, thank you. Oh. Oh, sorry, um, Cindy Nabel, District 3. I just wanted to add that um, when there were complaints about not knowing exactly what was going on, it's because we had to wait till we got a plan <laughs> set up to show people more we took their ideas, so we did that survey and did all that work. 
and this is the next step, but we have to wait till it's approved. We don't want to go and show them anything if it's not going to be approved. So um, it will be, you know, where we'll be handing out these kind of plans, you know, sheets of paper going out to the neighborhoods and, and handing them out so they can see them also. So they will get more information, definitely. Yeah, sure. Um, I just, one small question that came up as somebody that, asked me and I'm like, oh, I don't know of the answer to that. Has there been any discussion um, from the friends group about maybe doing any sort of commemoration about the site from the historical perspective of like, hey, for those of you who aren't aware, this is the reason this is called Emerson Park is because there used to be a high school here. Yeah, well, it's even more than that, Sean. It's it, the, the high school and its dedication to Ralph Waldo Emerson is even richer than just having a high mm -hmm. school here. And actually there are two schools buried there. Um, so there's, yes, we are very interested in that. And actually I just got an email. We are looking at having several dedicated areas using uh, Emerson's quotes as the basis for um, play and enrichment and outdoor enjoyment in our in our park. So, and so also, I just had somebody who was curious yeah. about like the, the history of the site. Like, is, is there going to be a plaque? Is there going to be some a yep. picture of the school or something like that? So yeah, okay. we've, that's that's good to hear. I can tell them that that is in the works. <laughs> absolutely, and and we also are talking about a sculpture that would incorporate not only the history of the site but the history of Stevens Point and the University of Wisconsin, which is really just around the corner. Mm -hmm. um, so history is rich and deep in this parcel, and we want to honor that past. It's an amazingly well-developed uh, plan, considering the short period of time that's been involved. And uh, I think at, at this point, it would be appropriate uh, to uh, for a motion to approve the uh, concept of the plan. Somebody want to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the concept as stated. I'll second. Okay. That was O'Connor with the O'Connor with the motion. Shabilsky with the second. Okay. Yeah. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Can you guys hear me? I think we can. Yep, Mike. Oh, oh hi, Mike. Okay. Yeah, hi, it's Mike. Uh, kind of messed up here on my computer, but uh... <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So, Bob, just real quickly before we move on, I just want everyone to know, uh, first off, uh, Alder Johnson, Alder Nabel, uh, Friends of Emerson Park, and, and the Park Commission, this is fantastic. Just so you guys know the process from here, it'll move on to a Common Council, obviously, and also the Planning Commission. Those are kind of two more steps before they can kind of move it forward, and you'll see this uh, several times as we start to develop down the road. So, uh, again, thank you for the Friends of Emerson Park uh, members you. for being here tonight. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, thank too. You. Yep. Bye. Okay, item number five uh, regarding the, the bench request for um, Cold Park by Prime Water Anglers. And my understanding is that um, there's an issue that perhaps needs to be looked at uh, um, regarding uh, policy and, and perhaps um, either establishing or revising some policy regarding benches. So, yeah, Bob, if, you, if it's okay if I add in here. So I, yes. the reason this is on the agenda tonight, um, as, as you're, you're probably all aware, the Prime Water Anglers are one of our tremendous partners in the community who do a significant amount with the boat piers and fishing piers in Bucolt and Piffner Park and in the area. Mm -hmm. uh, they also work with the local Muskie Club for some of the things that they do. They uh, they recently put in the accessible pier out at Bucolt, which I will share my screen here with you again real quickly so I can show you so you exactly know where I'm talking. Here's some images of it today. I just want to make sure you guys are seeing this. Are you guys seeing the photo of Bucolt here? No. Seeing a lot of blue. Must be the water. <laughs> Is that any better? No. Still not? Uh-oh. No. Hold on. No, it looks like a desktop, Dan. Wrong screen then. Let me try the next one. <laughs> How's that one? Yeah. Oh, there you there go. go. Now it is. 
So this is one of the most recent ones they put in on Buchel Park. And you'll notice that uh, how this program works, in case you're not aware, is they do work with when there's some local donors that are willing to step up. Um, and then they, they, they install it. And essentially, these have been pretty well, they're the maintenance um, cost free to the city. And they've been a, a tremendous partner of the city. What they, with, with this pro project, they approached me and asked about putting in a uh, bench in this area. And I want to show you the approach here. Um, their map in the packet, you see one of them kind of goes to one way, one goes the other way as a proposed location. Um, there's a couple things. First and foremost, I have talked to the former director and looked at some of our documents. We get several be uh, bench requests, memorial bench requests in the park every year. We have taken a stance essentially uh, for the last years, since I guess through Tom's tenure and even before him, that we have not allowed the memorial benches on certain situations where maybe it's in an area that a group organizes, maybe like the Auto Laban uh, area by uh, Kazakuski Park or other spaces that we have a user group that kind of manages it. That, that's been slightly different. The Green Circle Trail is one of those instances as well. But in the parks themselves, uh, the department has stayed away from that. Um, there's a number of reasons why. Some are that, you know, uh, you get mix and match. You don't end up with uniformity with several different types of benches. Another one is is the, the burden of maintaining those uh, as they deteriorate, the plaque that they get stolen. Uh, several things that kind of go into that piece. I'm going to, oh, I got to mute somebody here. Okay. So the reason this request is on the committee uh, agenda tonight is twofold. One, my recommendation to the committee is actually that we don't approve this tonight. Uh, they are a tremendous partner. I've been talking with them ex uh, extensively about this. A couple things come up here. Number one, this area has actually been asked about a lot for weddings now, believe it or not. Uh, by not having benches on both sides, it kind of lends itself to have chairs in here and people to get married out on that pier. So that, that question's actually come up several times. Number two is uh, we have denied a lot of these, basically every one of them in the past. So how do we uh, essentially allow one and not the other without developing a program? So my recommendation here tonight is actually to get a little two, twofold. One would be to actually at this point say that, that we would not allow this request to stay consistent with what we've done. But the second half of this would be to ask the commission if you are agreeable that we would that you'd allow me to work on a program to examine this. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, a lot of cities do have memorial bench programs. Um, some of them are less expensive than others and some set them up so that, you know, again, there's an option for people rather than just saying no, where they could have, there's a cost structure and there's a standard bench that you put in. Um, there's a couple trains of thought on it. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here real quickly and then I'll bring back another item. But uh, for example, the city of Marshall has a, a memorial bench program. There's is a couple thousand dollars you can put the bench in. Uh, it's a very similar program that what gets offered around the state. One uh, issue I would call it is when you let a memorial bench go in a park, you essentially have sold real estate in your park. That's really the way I, I kind of envision it and see it. That bench is gonna sit in a space that uh, was green space or was a park area that people passed through before. And now whether some like it or don't like it, they're gonna have to look at that bench and it may not necessarily always serve a, a lookout area or something that somebody sat. So, the, the city or the village of Sauk, uh, those of you that might be familiar, they actually changed this model a little bit. When they fundraised for the Great Sauk Trail, they said if you were going to put a bench on their trail, it was $5,000. And the reason they used that number is they said the bench is significantly less. Uh, they could buy a really nice bench, a uh, metal, nice placard for less, around 2000 or so. And the 3000 went in to do things for the trail, or potentially in this case, like for the bench, as well as it's a big enough financial commitment that people are taking it much more seriously. You know, it's those that really care about the area typically or really care about maybe a loved one or a family member or a friend that they want to put that bench in, but they come at it more so than maybe the instances where somebody just has a couple hundred extra dollars or something left over potentially maybe from an instance and they just want to put a bench somewhere. So um, I, th this is a big item and I don't know if we're going to tackle it tonight necessarily. So for the item on the agenda, my recommendation is right now so that we don't allow one and not for others, we deny it. And I would like to ask for the guidance if the commission's agreeable to let me bring back some more recommendations uh, to say, here's an option that we could do uh, to maybe have an option for people, but it, that it would be at a price point that we're not gonna have our parks become littered with memorial benches, if that makes sense. So so you're, you're looking for a uh, motion that it would incorporate both the denial at this time and then um, uh, revisiting this general issue of, of, of benches in the future. Yeah, 
that, that'd be great. And even if the revisiting isn't in the motion, if I guess even if some discussion that would say, hey, that sounds like a good idea or we'd like that train of thought, it would be helpful to get me started. Man, I didn't want to spend a bunch of time bringing something back if, if the committee would prefer to just say, we're not doing memorial benches because that is what we've done. Uh, and that is also the other option that could be considered here. So somebody want to make a motion. Yeah, uh, I will make a motion to that effect. I do think it's uh, an important part of the motion though to ask that staff uh, revisit this issue. And it sounds like it might be a good way to bring some additional monies into the park if we tie maintenance of the bench or other criteria to it. So I, I'd make a motion to that effect. I'll second. I'll second. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay. Looks like motion, the motion passes. Okay, then moving on to item number six, election of officers of the new of a new chairperson and vice chairperson. And I don't know if it's if it's been a, a rule, but as long as I've been on the, uh, the park board, we've always followed the policy after two consecutive years uh, in, in either of these positions to um, open it up to somebody else. So yes. my two years are up. And uh, so at this point, I don't know whether either somebody's got to volunteer or suggest somebody for for the, these two positions. I'd, I'd nominate Liz. Okay, so Mike nominated Liz. Mm -hmm. Okay, no other nominations. Um, well, I guess we can vote. All those in favor of Liz as the new uh, chairperson signify by saying aye. 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 And uh, any opposition or other? Okay. Looks. It looks like Liz. It's your job now. All righty. And, and let's see, vice chair. I think that's up too. Who is our current vice chair? I don't remember. I am. Okay. okay. Yep. So, any nominations for vice chairperson? Mike, are you interested? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. So Liz, are you nominating Mike? Yes, I am. Okay, very good. Okay, any, any, any other, other nominations? nominations? Okay, all those, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Okay. And I, I apologize, Bob, we do have one more item on this meeting before we let you off the chairperson role. I just accidentally had it wrong on the agenda. So you got one more <laughs> item. <to go. laughs> okay. Now talking about the maintenance agreement regarding the, um, the ratchet property, correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And I, I might, I should mention right away before I begin the discussion, I was, uh, I spent about an hour yesterday on the property with, uh, one of the other volunteers of North Central Conservancy Trust and looking it over. And my impression is that uh, um, most of what needs to be done can be, uh, can be done, I think, easily by the, the volunteers with the North Central Conservancy Trust. And uh, it includes, there's a certain amount of trash and much, much of it has already been picked up by some of the volunteers. Uh, we have an issue of some dead trees. We have um, um, one of the major issues that needs to be addressed is there is a tremendous infestation of young glossy uh, buckthorn, which is an invasive species. And um, it would be a big mistake not to handle it right now when they're small and can be pulled out easily. Otherwise, of course, this could become a much larger problem. And then also, there's probably some management in that um, there are some areas where there's very dense um, uh, regeneration of white pine. 
uh, which is actually a fairly common thing for, for the trees to congregate in openings. And in effect, it probably does a pretty good job of keeping other species up, but it's very inefficient in that uh, the trees are competing with each other. And, and after a certain number of years, usually one or two emerges as the dominant. But uh, management there would be thinning down to a few selected uh, trees and a few other issues. But the uh, agreement, um, the maintenance agreement with North Central Conservancy Trust um, is in your handout. And, and um, uh, I think that um, it probably would be appropriate then for us to vote on the, uh, to have a motion uh, approving this maintenance agreement. Bob, is it okay if I just say a few words before we, we take that motion? Yes, please. Too. So I, one thing I just want to let everyone know. So remember, there's two there's two documents here. When the city granted the money for the property purchase, there was a grant agreement, which you voted on and approved, that essentially protected the funds that the city invested for the property purchase so that if it ever was transferred, which is obviously not the, the goal of the NCCT, but if it happened, that the funds put in were protected and it gets get paid back to the city unless the city waives the right. So first and foremost, that's been addressed in that first grant agreement. This agreement is really about now maintaining the property uh, to be safe to the public. So the grant agreement called for it to be open to the public, not be developed. They're gonna put a conservation easement on the property. So all positive things that we wanted. The maintenance agreement now basically states that for 10 years, the city will be involved to keep it safe to the public. So Bob had mentioned so far, the NCCT has been fantastic. They're already in there working. They own the property. They'll be allowed to continue to do that. And they've got expertise that even some of our staff don't have for some of the invasives and uh, some people that are willing to put some time into that that we maybe not have been able to. So that's a great partnership. One thing that's in this maintenance agreement that you'll notice though is obviously if we would maintain this over 10 years, uh, we wanted to be mindful and protective of if the city, if the city never acquired the property, uh, would the city be out that 10 years of all the labor and things that are put in there? You'll notice there is a clause that shows that there's a $5,000 amount uh, put on that annual maintenance so that if something unforeseen as faces change, names change, council changes, NCTT board members change, that if something different went in that route, that not only would the city get the money back from the grant agreement, which has been taken care of, but that there's a dollar amount put on the maintenance that the city would put into it as well. So essentially, if you're looking at that 10 year period, it's $50,000. We would never anticipate that ever being the case, but we wanted to be mindful of it because of uh, the deed restriction and also that the city doesn't maintain private property in, in most cases. We only do our own property and this is a unique arrangement. Uh, as well in here, it just, it just basically specifies that we'll work with the NCCT, things like large tree removals, if there's something that would fall in a storm, uh, some of the things that we have equipment and things for is really where we probably will play a role as well as if uh, somebody calls and sees something unsafe, we can address it within our park maintenance staff in a quick manner. We also anticipate us taking the fence down, helping get rid of the trespassing signs, which is the first thing that'll happen once this agreement's passed so that we can open it up to the public, which I think is what everyone's ex you know, excited about and anxious about. Uh, it also talks about both parties working with the green circle, which has already been happening. The intention, the green, not intention, it, it will happen. The green circle will run through that parcel and then head uh, back towards the uh, backside of the skate park and around to connect in where it is now. Uh, other things that will probably come down the road that aren't necessarily in here, but are spelled out. We would not as the city pay for things directed by the NCCT. So i.e., let's say they wanna put some signage and things up about the NCCT, which likely will happen. It'll be a good thing. Talk about the partnership. Uh, shine some light on the, the positive things that that group does. We wouldn't pay for that, that signage, for example. However, if there's things that we would direct, similarly, they wouldn't pay for what, you know, things that the city would want to do, and we would work together on that piece. So aside from that, it's really straightforward. We don't anticipate any lawn mowing. We don't anticipate any snow plow removals. So really, it's getting property corners mm -hmm. marked, taking down that fence, opening it up to the public, getting green circle through it, and a tremendous partnership here between the NCCT and the city. Okay, well, we could um, uh, have a, a motion then to um, uh, approve the agreement and uh, any further discussion could be added in at that point. So moved. I can, I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No 
Okay, motion passes unanimously. And uh, the last item then would be the director's report. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do wanna go over uh, a few different things and, and actually a couple things that aren't necessarily listed in the report. So as you know, we are dealing with, as everyone is, that's why we're meeting the way we are with COVID-19. And I think one of the big pieces is how does that affect the park rec and forestry department? You'll see that the, the no, amount of people in our parks right now is, is, is significantly larger than even in a normal year. Um, a Green Circle Trail meeting last month showed that I th attendance on the trail itself was up over 150% compared to the year la uh, this same time period last year. Because as you know, it's one of the only things that people can do right now is try to get out and exercise and the weather's getting nicer, all of those things. Um, real quickly, I'm gonna run through my list and then I wanna talk about a couple big items. Uh, on the administrative side, we did actually go online reservation for the first time last Friday. So our timing, not by design, ended up hitting right when we needed this because people are able to go in and reserve their facilities without coming in our office that's closed. So Civic Rec did go up. Uh, we've done over $3,500 in it already. Uh, and the new, the new process in terms of policy and payment and things that this board approved here a few months ago is up and running and working well so far. Ann Hyla, our new administrative assistant, and Kate Gullickson from uh, the facilities at the Willet, really were the instrumental staff members that got that done. Uh, so we're excited to have that out and rolled out, and that's how we'll be moving forward. I have delayed uh, some of our hiring for seasonal staff because we do have a number of things closed. Uh, also being sensitive to, uh, we're rerouting and moving staff around based on uh, exposures and trying to limit as much interaction to get our main tasks done without adding a bunch of staff as we weather some of the loss in revenue that's going on within the parks department right now, uh, losing out on all of May's rentals, for example, uh, in, from the gym to our lodges to all those things that are going on. We also uh, limited, basically eliminated overtime unless it's mandated in the month of May for right now. So we rotated, essentially what I do with the maintenance staff is rotated them so that uh, they're working a modified shift. So one, one employee a week is working Tuesday through Saturday. And then the following week, another employee is working Sunday through Thursday so we can cover the weekend duties. Essentially, one big difference is when we have lodge rentals, we have to clean a bunch of buildings in addition to all the trash routes that we have. Under our current structure, because we don't have lodge rentals, we're not cleaning them. So we're essentially cleaning our restrooms that are open and then just getting the trash that's limited, the limited trash receptacles. So we're able to do it with one person versus multiple. And again, just trying to be sensitive to that uh, right now, you know, we're not hiring as many staff as we do in, in some of that normal overtime. Just getting us through the month of May, we'd really value it when we get to June. Um, we were on a modified schedule with our staff uh, for three weeks in late March into April. Essentially what happened is those that could telework went to teleworking remotely, uh, including myself for a period of that, our division heads. And then the hourly labor staff, we basically had a rotation where uh, they worked, reported for five days, and then they basically did online training for 10 days after that. We did a three week rotation with that as we responded basically to what was going on in the, in the environment at that point and what our EOC was doing. Then we shifted and went to a two week rotation. So basically five on five off. Uh, and during those basically days where they were paid on call, all of the hourly staff knocked out 28 individual online classes that traditionally we wouldn't have done so that they were uh, getting all of that out of the way so when we could return. As of the 27th of March, yeah, or I'm sorry, of April, all the park and rec staff came back. We spread out between six different uh, facilities in the parks. So between one of the cemeteries, the parks garage, the rec center, the Willard Arena, uh, the, the um, central company, as well as uh, the Iverson Park, we were able to split our staff out to have a couple people at each location so that we've got everybody reporting again and trying to keep up with, as you know, when grass starts growing and facilities are opening up and, uh, and basically we're, we're, we're operating with full personnel and evaluating when we're gonna to have to bring a couple more seasonals on to make the rotation. So uh, we do have our administrative assistant still teleworking because uh, she's the only person that can essentially do our payroll and those type of records and they're able to do that remotely yet. So she is not in the office with the office being closed, but we do have a plan to bring her back too as well as soon as we're able to open. So we're basically back to full-time, full-time staff working full everywhere, um, but we're trying to limit as much as we can the crossing over of staff so that if somebody were to become ill, that we're not uh, gonna run the risk of having our whole staff go down or not be able to ad address the park system. Moving on to the forestry side of things, we are in spring tree planting. Uh, so we've got over 150 trees going in the ground, working with some contractors and our staff to do that. So that's always a nice part of the, of the year. It's nice to see the trees greening up. We uh, were unable to do our traditional Arbor Day plant celebration. So we're gonna try to modify that and do it separately at a later date. Uh, but we are moving forward with everything else that we do with our planning. And we are performing our structure repairs on our playground equipment. 
they are closed by mandate right now of the safer at home, but we're still trying to repair them because they're going to see heavy use as soon as the playgrounds are open back up. Looking at the Willet Arena, we did put LED lighting upgrades in when the, when the Willet closed, and that's being paid for through the Energy Efficiency Grant through the Treasurer's Office. So some of the money that's left over on the budgeting process goes into that green initiative. We did apply and we were awarded that. So if you go into the Willet next year, you'll see much brighter and more efficient lights. Should cut the cost of the energy of the lighting system by 50%. The ice is out. The Willet is available for rentals. We did have the Sisters Escape and some other groups that were interested. We're kind of in a waiting game right now to see what happens here with our uh, the Safer at Home order. The swimming pool filter project is also running and it's right on schedule. We anticipate that to be done uh, in two weeks and that'll be ready to be used if we can. I am gonna circle back. I've got a spreadsheet I wanna show you about the pool and I do just wanna bring the Park Commission up to date about some evaluations that's going on with the pool as well as what the environment's looking like from the health department and uh, the state kind of guidance that we're getting right now. On the park side, I mentioned uh, special events, lodge rentals, our activities were all canceled through May, uh, which is unfortunate, but that's the environment we're in. Our play structure swings are closed, but our park locations are open. So they're definitely getting used heavily for walking, running, bicycling, hiking. Uh, Mead Shelter, Iverson's main restroom, the Buchholz boat, boat Landing, and the West Side restrooms in Gurkey, we did open as normal in May. Uh, so that we could we clean them daily to make sure that was guidance by the health department so that people can use them because people are in the parks and we're evaluating if we're going to start slowly opening the couple few extra that we have we do have two in a few parks that we've kept closed um, but we've given proper ppe face shields uh, cloth masks some of those materials to the staff so that they can uh, use that and clean those restrooms so that's kind of the process we're doing for right now um, in addition to that the tennis courts the skate park our disc golf courses our community stadium, stadium all opened up under the extension of the order. Some of those facilities were closed. We hung signage. We recommended basically the social distancing, the washing of hands, using hand sanitizer. We chained open some of the entrance gates, uh, told, you know, put signs about not touching other people's equipment. And, and so far we've been in really good shape there. We haven't had too much congregation going on. So we've been able to keep those facilities open. And again, we've been working with the health department very closely on what's allowable and what's not. We did bring park security back in. Uh, in a lesser role as well. Typically, we budget to have park security on for six hours uh, this time of year. We scaled that back to three, maybe get some budget savings again, given the, the, the situation we're in financially here as we navigate through this. So they're on eight from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. They lock up all the restrooms, keep an eye on it, but that will bring that cost down slightly here in May. Again, we'll continue to evaluate as we look forward into June. The Piffner Park Irrigation Project is also going. There's actually a hole dug already for the uh, for the valve that need to be repaired. And you'll see over the next five to 10 days, that they'll start putting in the rest of it. And we think that that'll be in here probably within the next two weeks. And that should allow it enough time to grow in before we hit the busy season. If there is one this year, again, we'll see how that goes. So the two big pieces I wanted to just give you summaries on, and if you have questions, I ask you to, to definitely let me know. One is Riverfront Rendezvous. So the last item here I've got in my manager's report is what's happening with Riverfront Rendezvous. We are evaluating and we're holding right now that it's still in play for essentially that 4th of July weekend. There's several elements that go into this decision essentially and we have decided as a committee to basically make that decision on May 15th and uh, sorry I was reading the chat here I'll come back to that okay um, so essentially what we're looking at here is one is, are we gonna be allowed to have it? it? When we come out of the Safer at Home, what stage are we gonna be in and what's the limit gonna be on crowd sizes? So that's a big piece of it. And we're continuing to evaluate that, talk with the health department. Second piece is budgetarily, what's the consumer confidence gonna be? We do rely on sales at that event to bring in a large amount of revenue that helps offset the expenses, basically breaks us even. So if we have to limit crowd sizes or if people are, aren't confident to come down in large crowd sizes, we run a financial risk at Riverfront Rendezvous of losing money. So we're evaluating that too. Second piece is, is what are the health requirements gonna be in terms of social distancing, personal protective equipment, food handling, uh, all of those type of things that are gonna go in. And really the last element is, what are we gonna have for staff and the staff comfort levels to be serving and be around those things? So all of that's being evaluated. And what I can tell you is, it's the last thing I wanna see happen in terms of a, a cancellation or a change, but we are looking at it and we'll come out uh, May 15th, ultimately after that date with a plan of what we do or where we go from here. Um, you probably did, go ahead, Liz. Um, Dan, I think 
really that's uh, that's been something that's been on my mind both the fireworks and riverfront rendezvous and uh the eaa the experimental aircraft show in oshkosh is being postponed till next year uh big top chautauqua up in bayfield is not having a season this year at all that's all being put off kids from wisconsin are not going to be doing their touring this summer Summerfest has been postponed till September. There's so many things through the state and there's a lot that I'm not aware of, but I think it would be irresponsible of us as a community to go ahead and hold something like that. Um, I've been down there most every year and I think most of us have been for a day or two or an evening or even just for the fireworks. And it's wall to wall people. Mm -hmm. And I think, why don't we look at maybe postponing it till Labor Day weekend. There's nothing ever going on. Well, there's Jazz Fest that weekend, but. Yeah, I can tell you, so that that is one of the scenarios we did play through and we're looking at is the term of postponing it. There's a couple things that go into it. One, we do staff it with seasonal staff, essentially, that uh, go back to basically, typically, and it's a typically year to school in, in mid-August, so we don't have the staff anymore, as well as some of the user groups, their availability for things like the food stands. Um, and the last piece also is in terms of the brand piece of it. You'll see some of the events that have canceled and said we're coming back next year is, you know, these, these events get held on a weekend. So how successful can they be later? Our event op basically operates on an enterprise situation where the money brought in, if there's excess revenue stays in the fund. So we also talked about if we delay to another weekend and don't do as well, uh, there is some potential for financial implications next year as well. Then if we would deplete the little bit of fund that's left over, would there be enough money to continue to run it? So uh, definitely, I, I appreciate the comments. We are looking at it. Um, I, I think it's it's less likely that we would postpone if we get to that scenario than, than uh, we originally maybe thought. There is festival, Jazz Fest is on that weekend. There's other weekends that, there's other events, events that are going on. Sure. I think the only real open weekend we had was the second or third and fourth weekend in August. And again, it's hard to know, know what the environment's going to be then too. Yeah. So I, we have been very, we've got our hand on the pulse very closely um, and continue to evaluate it. And I will tell you, um, if if a decision or if there's input that we need from the from the commission, I'll definitely be back before this commission asking for some more input on it. I just wanted to make sure everybody knows that we are talking through a lot of scenarios and we'll, we'll based on our health department guidance, um, obviously our city leaders as well, myself, our committee, um, we'll make the best decision we can with the facts we have here between now and ultimately the 15th is our plan. Hey, Dan? Yes. Is there costs involved for entertainment canceling or has there been a cost? So how that? we do our, how the contracts are set up is that uh, there's two things. We have a force majeure clause, which is basically what covers potentially, um, and I'm not an attorney, but it basically comes with this act of God or this pandemic and emergency we're under. There's some latitude there, as well as we build a rider in about 30 days pre-event um, some, some basically the ability to, to come out of some of those contracts. So what would happen if we had to, let's just say we had to cancel, for example, the promoters we're work with are working with these talent agencies that we book with. We would be going through those elements of the contracts. Um, there's very likely we would probably try to maybe book things for next year potentially, or we would talk about, you know, how we bring them back because we want to be fair to the artists too, but that would uh, the financial piece of it would be very minimal is what I'm, uh, what I'm seeing with our contract and how we book that out. Thank you. I can also tell you that our firework contract this year uh, is negotiated before we signed it that we do not, if we cancel, there is no out of pocket expenditure loss. It just requires a $5,000 deposit for next year that mm -hmm. would go towards the overall cost. If we postpone, there's no additional cost. We just pay for it. So the firework vendor was very conscious of what's going on. Um, they did say if they have to hold product or because they buy product a year in advance, things of that nature, that the down payment would allow them to, to weather the winter. And then they would just apply that towards whatever our balance is for next year. So we wouldn't be out the money on the fireworks either. Uh, luckily, if there's luck in this, that contract was not signed till after it hit. So we were able to negotiate a, a favorable deal for the city there on that piece of it too, trying to be conscientious. Okay, um, so I guess before I move on from Riverfront, is there any other questions on that at this point? So May 15th is your deadline? May 15th is when we intend to make a decision, correct. Okay, so, thank you. Dan, are you using the Badger bounce back plan that the governor proposed as the guiding principle for this? Yes. Okay. That, that as well as uh, CDC or the CDC kind of PPE requirements, mm -hmm. um, those two elements, as well as staffing. 
Yeah, because again, the the contracts, the some places are really we dealt a lot with this this spring. Um, a lot of places have been fairly forgiving with the act of God, also including the stay at home orders. So, yeah. but as we get further into the year and they keep losing revenue, they may not may not be as forgiving as they were in March. Definitely, and that's one of the things we talked about as well was making sure that we're we're fair to them, they're fair to us, and that we do it in a timely manner so we're not holding anybody on for too long. No, it makes sense. Can I make one other comment on that too? Um, I, I think one of the problems will be is that because so many other things are being canceled in surrounding communities, that if we do hold something, it's going to attract even perhaps even more people because they want to get out and do something. So we might even get, you know, more people than we really want to have turn up for something like that. So it's that's a it's a good point. And also what we're hearing in terms of early indications is social distancing is not going away. So how do you social distance that many people too? Yeah. And how do you patrol that? And there's a lot of elements here. So, uh, but yeah, like I said, we've been actually meeting for basically since before it started. We met every couple of weeks planning anyways. Uh, and the last seven to eight weeks has been only talking about these scenarios. So, um, mm -hmm. and I've had several conversations with Alders too, just kind of talking about the financial pieces of it. And I think all those things will culminate then for the 15th to make a decision and we'll get the, the literature out which way we're headed after that point. Okay, oh, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, like the uh, pool going to be opening on time and any concern there that uh, could have a problem? Um, yep. So that's a great question because now you're going to see a, a spreadsheet on the pool. So the other big element is pool. What what does pool mean? So I will tell you that uh, we are in the, we're members of the Wisconsin Park and Rec Association and we're on conference calls with park and rec directors and staff across the state. Um, almost every day talking through the same things as well as meeting with their health department. We do have a meeting tomorrow with the health department to continue the pool discussion. Here's what I'll tell you. We have built basically three scenarios at this point. We're hearing things on our calls. Uh, there is a lobbyist for the Park and Rec Association that CDC guidelines on pools, if they're gonna be permitted to open, are gonna include things like social distancing, potentially face masks being required for all lifeguard staff and all staff and potentially maybe even the public unless they're in the water, uh, having to frequently disinfect slides or any touchable surfaces, um, having to monitor the social distancing with non-lifeguards because lifeguards have to watch the water. So having additional staff for that. Um, I'll tell you that concerns for me as staff and the rest of my staff has been, what's the safety of the public gonna be at the pool? They're also talking about, are we going to have to limit group size? So following the Badger Bounce back, if it's 10 people or 50, that can impact revenue numbers significantly of who comes into open swim. If we have to limit the number, like 10, for example, we have nine people for lifeguards alone. So then we're not even going to be able to open there. If it's 50, then you're at 40, right? Uh, the other things we talked about is what, what's going to happen with like the drop, you know, our drop, the slide or anything going to be allowed to be open. Can we clean that appropriately? Or would we have to close that piece of the pool off? Concessions are basically a no-go what we're hearing. So we're looking at that. Uh, we're also uh, reviewing, do we need the proper PPE? Are we gonna be able to secure it in the timeline we need? Uh, we're looking at staffing concerns. Are 16, 17, 18 year old college kids gonna be able to enforce some of the CDC guidelines that go with the pool? Um, are parents gonna be as, as uh, willing to say, go ahead, son or daughter, to go to work for the park and rec if they know they're gonna be out with other people in the pool? Uh, you know, we're asking, you know, there's a lot of things that, that staff traditionally not have to deal with that we'd have to do. Other things that have been delayed with the pool is things like our trainings. Usually we're already doing them now. We can't. So that's kind of delaying some of the start dates. Uh, so ultimately, you know, as we delay, things get more challenging and we don't have the guidance yet. We expect it's going to come soon. But what we did as I, uh, when I met with the staff, as I said, let's build out three plans. So on this spreadsheet here, uh, we've got a June 13th opening. We've got a July 1st opening and we've got a pool close plan is really what we've developed. So I'll, just so you guys would see apples to apples, our budget for 2020 is actually to take an $87,000 loss at the pool. That is a, that's the straightforward budget that we do for the pool. Um, if you look at the 2018 actual, it was a $73,000. I'm going to call it a subsidy for the pool. But now, if that's the first time you guys maybe have seen that, don't be alarmed. I can tell you that I've got spreadsheets from Middleton, Onalaska, uh, La Crosse, all of them are in similar dollar ranges. Pools don't make money anywhere. They really don't. They become a really a community piece that, uh, again, communities love them, kids, families. It's, it's a huge important piece of our community and they aren't revenue generating. Typically after the first couple of years, they do cost some money. So 
Um, but I think it's, a, again, under our circumstances, it's worth evaluating. Last year, 2019 actuals, you'll see it was actually a $100,000 loss. And that was because revenue dipped because right before I got here, you guys probably remember the pool had to close a couple of weeks due to a, a maintenance issue. So not only did revenue drop about seven or 8,000, if you look down at the contract uh, equipment to do the repair, that was way over budget to do those repairs too. So we had 15 or 16,000 spent for repairs, loss in revenue, that added to that total that uh, was, was basically overall for the subsidy. So looking at the subsidy here, if we said we plan 87, we, we anticipate with our forecast, we took the revenue and said, if we're allowed to have half as many people in our pool, that drops our revenue by 50%. If consumer, again, being conservative here, if consumer confidence isn't as high as we think it's going to be, we use 35% as a number, as a gauge. That would be just under 15,000 in revenue. If you go down to our expenses, if we open, those are still fairly fixed. We're about five days later than normal. So we would anticipate our wages to be down 5,000. But essentially we'd say it would cost us $125,600 to run it. We'd take in 16. I would forecast, I'm forecasting a deficit if we open June 13th of 109,000. If we open July 1st, that deficit comes back further because we cut staff uh, by $20,000. However, the July 1st wild card is we may have seasonals that go elsewhere. And if we don't have enough lifeguards, we might not be able to open. But we did plan here to say, okay, if we lost another third of the season, our revenue would go down about 6,000. Uh, our costs would go down about 20. So the deficit would decrease and be closer to budget, but that's kind of the, the window. And then for comparison, uh, I've got a forecast that says if we don't open, we do have still some fixed costs on utilities because we'll have to run some pumps and still have some water go through. Don't have to treat it as much so our chemical comes down, but that deficit number would come down to more. And this is a conservative estimate, like 43,000 is what it would be. So uh, Mike, getting back to your question, We'd love to open the pool. We're continuing to monitor it. Tomorrow I have a conference call with the health department, but also from safety standpoint for staff, safety standpoint for the community, as well as what the Badger bounce back plan is. It's a wild card right now. I do anticipate on Monday night to be in front of the finance committee for the city, sharing these revenue numbers and these projections so that they know as well what the financial picture looks like. And we can, we'll continue to monitor. I think our first decision on the pool is going to be do we, the city of Wausau, for example, has already said we're not opening in June. They've already told that so they could tell their staff. And I anticipate us having to do something similar so that we can tell our lifeguards where we don't have to wait anymore. This is our plan. Um, and, and as a whole, then that would give us a little bit more time to decide for July. But, but I also want to be cognizant, and that's why I'm asking the finance committee of here's the financial aspect of it uh, to get their feedback too in case they have a different direction on it. So short answer is tomorrow we're talking about the health department. We've got three plans and based on the environment that we see over the next week to 10 days, I anticipate making the decision on the June part. And then unless there's further guidance from this committee or from the finance committee, uh, that would be the, the decision for the summer as a whole. Hey, Dan. Yes. I, I think it's a good recommendation as Marathon County did waiting until July. Um, my concern on this, if we do have a warm June, are we going to have a lot of people swimming in the river and uh, Iverson Park? And we already seem to have a concern with the playgrounds, um, people using them. I guess that's another question. How are we enforcing that? Tend, that tends to be a problem already. Um, I guess that, that's a question. Who's going to enforce it now if we don't open the pool? Are we going to have all those people in the river in, in, in Iverson Park? How's yeah, that going to be handled? I can tell you that, uh, for example, they allowed campgrounds to open at the 1st of May, but yet, uh, which said pools could not open with them, but uh, beaches were allowed, at least in, in Portage County. That's what uh, our health department told me, if social distancing is observed. Enforcement would be law enforcement. That's how we worked it, even with playgrounds, for example. It's really complaint driven. Mm -hmm. um, the park staff, as you know, can't issue tickets. So we can warn, we can tell people they might have to leave, but it, it would be law enforcement that would have to do the actual enforcement if, if those issues came up. How are we uh, doing playgrounds currently? I've seen several posts come across that the playgrounds are being used. I noticed Wausau actually took security fence around their playground equipment to keep people off. Is that something yeah. we're... Caution, they did, uh, caution tape is what Wausau did. Um, I can tell you that uh, there's been like locations to the south too, like by Madison, for example, that use snow fence. Both of them are mixed results. Those that are gonna play on the playground are still scaling those fences and using them. So I can tell you, we put a sign up 
uh, with, on a piece of lath that says it's closed until further notice. We put out social media posts, obviously the governor's orders out. Um, and ultimately it's been complaint driven. So if we get a complaint, we address it at that point. We talk with our police department. Um, but as you know, you know, we have over 20 playground set, sets. Um, it, is it hundred percent compliance? It's not, it's been based on basically those complaints. Uh, Dan? Yes. Uh, I have a question about, we've got, there's quite a few activities that take place in Hipner Park over the summer months, especially like June into July. Like there's a concert series, there's um, movies in the park. Um, I know at our last meeting, we had approved uh, an event for June 19th. And I'm just wondering what's happening with those kinds of things in the parks. So ultimately everything through May 26th uh, has been canceled or, or moved. Um, I can tell you that, uh, I don't know if Levitt's gonna announce this yet, but they have booked the back end Thursdays or the back end of the summer. They were already in conversations about uh, like the front pieces. I don't know if they've officially moved them yet, but they were putting a plan in place that they could relocate those. I did talk to City Band. City Band is basically waiting for when they're told the green light, they're not practicing. They're aware that they're likely not to be able to do June. And our special events will, will rely on their own personal planning as well as what we allow them. And I can tell you our department, if it is phase one of the Badger bounce back plan of 10 people, we would extend lodge rentals not being allowed uh, as well as special events in the park, as long as that order is to comply. And again, that's where our health department's been a big uh, asset for us to say, okay, this is what the ruling is, give us some interpretation. So we are monitoring closely. And, and ultimately, if we're in phase one on May 26, I can tell you confidently then, we would extend that deadline probably 15 days, I would think, to see what happens with the next phase or when it happens and continue to bump that as we go. We are also tracking the loss in revenue for lodge rentals and those type of things, because uh, all of that, you know, we, we want to have a, a good picture of it as we go through this. Oh. A lot of challenges. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a different oh. time, definitely, no doubt. And, uh, you know, while we're, the parks are definitely busy, there's a lot of uh, decisions to be made here on our big, our big attractions, you know, the pool. Oh, and obviously, you. the later it goes, you start getting into football season or things like that, that'll all be part of it, too. So I guess ultimately that's the update. I'm happy to take any questions if you have more. Uh, again, the two big ones that are coming is Riverfront Rendezvous in the pool, what's gonna happen. Uh, and I, I, we are very invested looking into it, playing out a lot of scenarios. And um, ultimately, if, if we get further in the process, there's a chance if we need something, I may call a special park commission meeting. Otherwise, if we get some more solid direction from the health department, uh, if something needed to be canceled, for example, that would probably likely happen subsequent of independent uh, committee action. That's all I have. I appreciate it. Well, we could have a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thanks, Bob. Aye. Okay. A video of this meeting is available for viewing on the city's website, stevenspoint.com slash videos.